Okay, so today we're having some flash issues. I will try to fix that when I edit the video. But today, what we need to talk about, I think, is kind of important to a lot of people. I joke around a lot that I need to buy a t-shirt that says I pee when I sneeze. Um, there was a topic that came up on one of the Facebook groups where there was a, a woman, yet another person, who had come in and was talking about how it, it a stress incontinence that takes place often for a lot of women after childbirth, but it happens for other reasons too. Um, people who are not, you know, elderly whose bodies are just breaking down because, you know, they're 70, in their 70s or whatever and things are not working quite as well as they used to. Um, these are women who are as young as, you know, early 20s who now have, you know, varying degrees, very mild to moderate to sometimes pretty scary uh, loss of bladder control um, after giving childbirth or after having back injury or after having surgeries or this kind of thing. And, and there's a level of embarrassment or a level of shame that goes along with that, and that's kind of what I want to preach about for a couple of minutes in this video. As a person who has, myself, suffered from varying degrees of mild stress incontinence um, for, you know, since my daughter was born, so 12, 12 and a half years, that I have had really mild and what, you know, the, the medical studies I've read refer to as a low, bothersome level of incontinence. Um, I feel qualified to talk to you a little bit about the emotional side of things on this. And I'm going to give you some numbers here that I got from some studies, and I'll tell you all about those and, and provide the link where I got it in the description for this video. However, what I'm going to impart to you right here at the beginning, I am not a clinician. I am not in any way medically trained. Okay, so when I talk to you about these things, I'm approaching them from a you know, I'm showing you mine so that you'll feel more comfortable about yours kind of perspective. Absolutely nothing that I say in any of my videos should ever be used to contradict or to countermand or to substitute for the advice of a medical professional. Because those are the people who go to college for like 30 years and get themselves into debt up to the eyeballs because they have this passion to learn about the human body and help people. So as another person who's been, you know, I have a list of, of health problems that I've been dealing with. So I go to see doctors and I've been frustrated with my medical care before. I have felt like I wasn't being heard before. I've been in situations that made me not want to, quote, trust, end quote, my medical care professionals. However, the medical community um, in the United States especially is very large. We have thousands upon thousands of doctors and paramedics and nurses and nurse practitioners and people of varying levels of, you know, different kinds of physical therapists and chiropractors, people who in, in some way or another have taken time, money, personal passion, and devoted their life's work to taking care of people who have pathology, meaning something medically wrong with, their bodies. So don't allow a bad experience with one or two individuals from that community to sour you against listening to the people who actually know what they're talking about. There is a great deal of wisdom in homeopathic methods. There's a great deal of wisdom in, you know, anecdotal experience, you know, those things. I'm not discounting those things. But with things as important as incontinence, for example, you know, that is a very basic function of the body. And I'm going to strongly recommend in the rest of this video that you see a doctor and I'm going to talk to you about why if you, if you suffer from any level of stress incontinence um, that was caused by whatever reason. Um, but anyway, so just remember, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a nurse, I'm not a paramedic, I've never even taken an anatomy course because I didn't major in the sciences. I'm a history major, okay? So this video is not meant to be informational, this is not an educational video. What I want to do with this is let you know that you are not alone, let you know what some of your options are that I've been made familiar with, and then I'm going to talk to you about a couple of options that you can use, cloth-related, you know, reusable things, um, to help yourself be more comfortable on a daily basis. 
okay? So that's what this video is about. Do not watch this video and then use that as a reason not to seek professional medical care, okay? That was it. Let's get into my ideas. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some numbers. So, because I think that a lot of people who go home after whatever traumatic event or delivering a baby and discover, oh my gosh, I can't control my pee anymore. I can't control my urine anymore. What just happened to me? This is humiliating. What do I do? And so the first thing I'm going to do is illustrate to you how very not alone you are, how much company you have in this situation, okay? Now the numbers I'm all gonna, that I'm going to give to you were published in a urology journal, um, and it's available online, so the link to everything that I'm going to talk about numbers-wise, I'm going to put that link in the description on this video so that you can go and look at it yourself. Um, obviously, it was written in a, in a medical review journal, so it's, it's one of those studies that was put in a journal for peer review, and, and it's not written in, I mean, it's boring, it's not an exciting read, but it is written in plain enough English that I think that, you know, if you if English is your first language or if you're fluent in English, I don't think that you'll have trouble understanding what they're discussing in that article. So I do recommend that you give it a look. But I'm just going to go over some of the numbers that talk about the prevalence of urinary incontinence. And the numbers I'm going to give you are, are specifically for the female population, but the article does include male population information as well. So for any males who are watching this video, these numbers um, that I'm quoting right now are, are specifically the, the female findings, but the male findings are also in there as well. So I'm going to stop this clip because it's really skippy today, and then I'm going to give you all of the, the numbers information based on age groups. In this 1995 study that I read, which was, you know, not ancient history, and we can assume that not a whole lot has changed in the last 20 years about the prevalence of urinary incontinence, it may shock you to find out, because it did me, that uh, in the youngest age group included in the study, 15 to 19 year olds, so we're talking about teenagers, in the group of 15 to 19 year olds in the population, one out of 10 experiences incontinence of some sort. They have urinary incontinence for some reason. Uh, whether that's stress incontinence, whether that's due to an injury, uh, I don't believe it's specified, or if it did, I didn't, I missed that. But one out of every 10 15 to 19 year olds you run across, um, they have some form of urinary incontinence. In the age group of 20 to 24 year olds, it is 18%. So almost one out of every five 20 to 24 year olds you run across has some form of urinary incontinence. In young adults as a larger group, it is 20 to 30%. So one out of five to one out of three people in the young adult category, which I'm assuming would go up to like 25, maybe up to 30, um, uh, one out of five to one out of three of those people experience urinary incontinence. When you get into middle age, which people my age, you know, people in their 40s, uh, people in their late 30s, that is 30 to 40 percent of that population. So one out of three to just under one out of every two people you run into in my age group, uh, females again, these numbers were specifically the women in the study. Uh, one out of three to just one out of two, just under one out of two women uh, that you run into in middle age have stress incontinence. And then when you get into the elderly, which is, you know, people I'm assuming above the age of 50, like because they specifically mentioned later on uh, the prevalence between 60 to 80 year olds, uh, but that's 30% to 50%. So one out of three to one out of every two people. So basically, once you get up over the age of 35, Pretty much one out of every three people you run into, they pee when they sneeze. So not only are you not alone, you are in such large company. And these numbers, which were conducted in the United States, but I'm pretty sure because these are per capita percentage type numbers, you could extrapolate those figures and compare them to your own population in whatever part of the world you happen to live in, and they're probably pretty similar. So, you are not alone. This is something that is beyond your control. It's not your fault. So if you're one of these people, you know, where you go out on a date and you're watching a movie and you laugh and pee comes out and you spend the rest of the night humiliated and ashamed and thinking, my God, this just is not supposed to happen to people. This does not happen to people. I'm healthy. I'm young. What is going on here? You're not alone. Okay, 
It's not your fault. You have absolutely nothing to be ashamed of, okay? Now, it's just a little bit of pee. Repeat with me, ladies and gentlemen, it is just a little bit of pee. And for those of you on the other side of the pond, it's only a little bit of wee. So however you say it, pee, wee, it's just a little bit. And we're gonna talk to you about some ways that you can deal with it. Because for most of us, it can be vastly improved or gotten rid of altogether. But the key is you gotta go see a doctor. Cadence is being needy. She's right here. Yeah, see, see listen to this. I, I don't know what she wants, but I am not adequately providing it for her. I know, baby. You wanna come up and say hi? No? Okay, she just wants to cry a little bit. All right. Of all of these numbers, the one that shocked me the absolute most in this study is that of the entire population, yeah, Cadence finds this shocking as well, is that 40% of the people who suffer from stress incontinence never go to a doctor, not even one time, to seek treatment for their urinary incontinence. And that's really got to stop because there are a lot of things that modern medicine can do to assist people who have these problems. And most of them are relatively easy. So I'm going to go into the next one and give you some things that, that I think maybe you should you look into. And again, this is where we get into dicey territory. And I want you to remember that I'm not a medical person. I've never met you in person. So I have no idea why in your particular body you pee when you sneeze. Lots of different reasons that could happen. I don't know what the cause of your particular issues are. So none of these procedures or options that I'm going to tell you about necessarily apply to you. That's why you have to go see a doctor. I'm going to make a special note for any men who may be watching this video now. Because with men, um, the prostate, which of course is something that we females do not possess, or generally have any experience with unless we are medical people, which as I have repeatedly told you, I am not. Uh, when men experience urinary problems, whether that is an increased urge or reduced um, voiding, you know, you have a reduced volume, like you go, to, you go to pee and like three drops come out, you still feel like you have to pee but nothing else is happening. The prostate is intricately involved in a great number of the male uh, incontinence related issues. So if you are a male, if you're a man, or a 15 to 19 year old male who is not yet a man but is having stress incontinence, number one, go to a parent and say, please take me to a doctor. Don't just ignore it, okay? Um, I know that things like peeing your pants, you know, having a wee in your knickers is not exactly the kind of thing that people want to talk about, but that's the problem. Um, that's why almost half of us don't go see a doctor. And I think that for men, uh, sometimes this can be something they really don't want to discuss because women tend to get together in little clutches and talk to one another about these things a little bit more easily than men, which says a lot because we don't talk to each other about it as often as we should. We really don't because there's still this huge shame slash stigma on it. So if you are a man and you are having stress incontinence, may I encourage you with even more vigor and more passion than I am when I'm speaking directly to the ladies out there, please go see a urologist. Please have your prostate checked. Make sure that there is nothing because when there are problems with the prostate, some of that stuff can get life-threatening in my understanding. So just please, if you're a man, don't put up with it. Don't put up with it for another day. Go see a doctor. So once you've decided to go and talk to a doctor, the question becomes, what's gonna happen? What are they gonna do? Um, and I think where, I should say, where my dissatisfaction with my medical care professionals has come in in the past is because doctors have protocols. They have particular methods that they follow they go from point A to point B to point C. If it's not A, then we move to B. If it's not B, then we move to C. And they do these, you know, there's scientific method involved in that. It's, you know, you start with the most obvious, uh, you start with the least invasive, you start with the most probable or the most common. And then once you've ruled out those things, then you move on to the things that are maybe a little more invasive and may cause the patient pain. So, you know, they'll avoid doing those tests until they've ruled out all the easy stuff. So 
in a lot of my personal experience with medical care where I tend to get frustrated and impatient is when I go in and I know because I've been through something like that before or because I've you know or because I've been listening to my body for a while and I know that all of this stuff under A isn't it and isn't going to help and isn't going to do anything like the first time I herniated a disc in my back I knew it wasn't muscle pain I knew it wasn't muscle spasm I and the doctor after examining me I went in there this was years and years and years ago but I went in and I was in you know solid level 8 pain I I was having trouble keeping it together you know what I mean and I went to see my general practitioner back then three times in a row and she kept telling me to take more ibuprofen and there was a point where I was sitting in the exam room and I wanted to scream at her do you honestly think that I would have called up here gotten a babysitter for my daughter and, and made an appointment to come see you and sit in this office and talk to you about this stuff and have you weigh me and take my blood pressure if I hadn't tried taking ibuprofen you know you just want to shake people but the thing you have to remember and, and, and the way that you have to be patient with your medical personnel is that in order for them to do their job correctly, they have to start with point A. Even if you come in and you say, no, 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 I'm already at C. So can we please skip A and B and go to C? Be patient with your doctor, especially if it's a doctor that you're seeing for the first time. They are morally and ethically and professionally obligated to follow protocol, okay? So I know it gets frustrating. Believe me, you have my deepest empathy. Not just sympathy, empathy. I have been there. So I understand that for a lot of people, that may be the stumbling block. It's like, okay, I'm going to make an appointment, Amy. I'm going to go see the doctor because you just harassed me to go to the doctor, and I can tell you exactly what's going to happen. I'm going to go in there, and they're not going to do a darn thing to help me. Maybe not on the first visit, no, because they're going to start with A, because they have to rule out all of A before they can move on to B. Does that make sense? So breathe deeply. <sighs> Recognize that urinary continence can be a very complicated thing, and, and like I said, there are many, many different reasons, and the doctor has to follow protocol in order to isolate and properly diagnose your particular problem. Okay, so don't let that be your frustration. So now I'm going to go into, I'm going to stop giving you the go to the doctor, go to the doctor, go to the doctor. I'm going to stop that now, I swear. And I'm going to tell you what some of the things that your doctor is probably going to suggest might look like. I look a little disheveled right now. And it's because, okay, in the interim, since the last little clip where I told you, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to go and I'm going to talk to you about what the different treatments that they suggest might look like. Yeah, I got a little notice, a little fraud alert on my account. So over the last weekend, someone tried to spend $4,000. And in my house, I don't know about your house, but in my house, $4,000 is, pardon the expression, a metric buttload of money, okay? So I've been dealing with that. Let me finish dealing with that. Okay, y'all, I'm back. I had to put on my, my Arkansas shirt so that I can feel warm and safe after having been violated by thieves this morning. But I have an excellent bank, and they took really good care of me, and so all of that has been locked down. We're going to get our money back. Everything's going to be taken care of, and I will actually be able to pay my rent this month, so that's brilliant. Okay, so let's get back into... Um, What's going to happen? If you go to the doctor, and let's say that you're seeing a doctor you've never seen before, or maybe even a GP, that this is the first time you've ever talked to them about your urinary incontinence, some of the things they may suggest will start with things that are, you know, um, behavioral. Uh, they're going to suggest things like um, trying to train your body to urinate on a schedule, like to hold it even after you feel the urge. Now, this may depend on which kind of incontinence you have. If you have incontinence when you sneeze or cough, they're going to treat that differently than whether you have an urge to go and then you go and there's only a little bit and then you have to go. So it depends on whether your incontinence is the type where you have to go more frequently than usual or normal 
or whatever, or then is healthy, or whether you have a situation where you don't have any sensation that you need to urinate, but then you cough or laugh or stand up too fast and boom, you get drips, okay? So they may suggest things like holding it and only going a certain number of times a day. They may uh, suggest something called double voiding, which is where, you know, they'll say, okay, whenever you have to urinate, you go to the bathroom, you do your business, stand up, kind of walk around a little bit, and then go sit down and try to do it again. Mm -hmm. um, then they may suggest different things like um, a, a calendar or a, a clock on when you drink. They may make some dietary recommendations that sort of thing. They will almost guaranteed, whether you're a man or a woman, they will almost guaranteed um, talk to you about your pelvic floor muscles and you can Google a pelvic floor anatomical chart and you can look at the different muscles that are involved for males and females in the pelvic floor. They're probably going to recommend kegels, they're probably going to recommend squats and those are basically different ways that you can isolate and force the pelvic muscles to contract. And for women, those, that's going to be, well, and for men, um, for men, I know less about your anatomy than I do about female anatomy. Again, not medical person, but these are things your doctors are probably going to talk to you about. You know, your, your sphincter muscle, the muscles in and around your vagina, um, the muscles that are down there underneath, um, you know, the, the little diaphragm type muscles underneath the pelvis, you know, I'm seriously get a get an anatomy book or something because I'm not your girl for that but the pelvic floor muscles all the stuff that governs you know sexual control um, urinary control bowel control all those muscles down there are in your pelvic floor and they will recommend some different things that you can squeeze different things that you can squat there are things called uh, they call them Benoit balls but those t tend to have a sex toy connotation. Um, there are things that are just weighted balls that are vaginal weights for women to help them. Um, there, Those are going to be some of the things that they check first. They'll probably do some internal exams where they go in there and they make sure that you don't have some prolapses, you know, like a bladder prolapse, and they may do some things like that. Uh, some things in category B may be a catheterization to see how much, you know, if you have a bladder prolapse that's retaining urine so that even after you have gone and, and you feel like you have voided your bladder, there's still a lot left in there and they'll do that with a catheter test. Um, we're skipping, so I'm going to come back and, and keep talking. Um, be right back. Okay, so I had to go and um, turn off Facebook because... I'm getting lots and lots of blips from the people I told about my financial violation this morning, in addition to which everything was starting to skip again. So, okay. So point A, you know, that first step is they're going to talk to you about some behavioral things, some exercises you can try. They're going to talk to you about fluid intake. They're going to try and isolate what your symptoms are. So whether you have urge incontinence, too frequent trips to the bathroom, or whether we're talking about just for whatever reason you cannot stop the flow of urine, you know, when you feel like you've voided. So they're going to rule out some things. Um, and there are a series of tests that they're going to do for that, and some of them can go up to something as invasive as a catheterization to check for bladder prolapse and things like that. Um, they might do what they did with me in physical therapy because my, my urinary continence was caused by nerve damage post-childbirth. And whereas I actually have a wicked strong pelvic floor because of all of the exercises that I still do just to maintain some control, I have a strong, healthy pelvic floor, but I cannot feel it. I can't, you know, when my brain tries to squeeze those muscles, I don't feel, I don't physically feel them obeying my brain telling them to contract. So I've done lots and lots of exercises. I have used the, the weights, the internal weights that you use to squeeze, and that really kind of skeeved me out at first, but it was a whole lot better, and it has improved my ability. It has improved my ability to control the volume that comes out when I sneeze or cough, etc. Another thing that they may or may not suggest, uh, depending on your doctor, is they have uh, electrical stimulation. Um, if you have suffered some kind of nerve damage that makes you incapable of, or if your pelvic floor has atrophied to the point that you are incapable of uh, consciously contracting your pelvic floor muscles, they may use electronic stimulation, which is basically where, uh, for women, I don't know how they would do this for men, um, or if they do it for men, I'm not sure. Uh, but for women, I know, they will insert 
this little thing into the vaginal canal and it gives a very gentle electrical pulse that forces the muscles to contract. And you can talk to your doctor about that. I'm not going to go into detail. Um, and then, of course, if you have something that they can treat with medication, you know, there are medications that can, that can ease your discomfort if your problem is urge-related. Um, and then you get into, you know, there's, there's all kinds of medical surgeries. Then there's medical devices. There are things that they can put in your body, you know, if you have, for example, I mean, again, these are not medical terms, okay? You know, I talked about the grimped, crimped garden hose effect, keeping you... If you have like a collapsed tube or a tube that's not where, you know, if one of the pathways is not working, they have, you know, things that they can put in there to help you keep the, the pathways open so that you can urinate properly. I don't know the terminology. Again, consult a medical professional. But I know that there are things that they can put into your body, into your urinary tract that can, you know, implants or, I don't know, medical stuff that they stick into your body that will help those things work. Now, and in the, in the, um, in the case of prolapses and, and nerve damage and stuff like that, sometimes there are surgeries they can do. Um, there's, and you can look those up. You can look up surgeries to treat urinary incontinence, and there are several different types. And obviously, before you get to that, like I said, your doctor will have gone through A, B, C, D, E, F, you know, you're going to get pretty far down the alphabet, and when your doctor has determined that whatever your problem is, it can be treated best by one of these surgeries, they, they do those kinds of things. Um, so, you know, we're talking about everything from teaching you how to flex muscles, to giving you oral medications, to giving you injections, to uh, catheteriz catheter catheterizing you to check for certain different kinds of things and and the health of your bladder whether you have a prolapse a prolapse in your bladder means like you know your bladder is supposed to be a ball but like like if one part of it has folded over so you've got I don't know I don't have anything here to demonstrate with all this crud in my office and I don't have anything to demonstrate with but let's you've got a ball and for some reason part of the balloon is wrinkled over there might be you know, some fluid being retained over here in this prolapsed part of the bladder, or the bladder might be pushing somewhere, or may, there may be something pushing on your bladder that shouldn't be, you know, so they'll check those kinds of things with those kinds of tests. And then you move into things that are more invasive, like, you know, fixing something that's broken by putting an artificial piece inside your body to help your organs work properly, or surgeries to correct something that needs to be surgically corrected. So, like I said, it's way more complex than just saying, oh, they can fix that, you know? And I see a lot of people doing that. Oh, it's a simple thing, just go in. It's so simple to have it fixed. That's not necessarily true. And and I, you know, urinary incontinence has many different causes. It has many different manifestations. And there are many different treatments. And some are going to get you all the way back to normal as though you never had a problem. Some of them are going to just lessen your symptoms, and some people may not find a whole lot of benefit from any of it at all. So there's no universal anything except this. The one universal thing is, if you don't seek medical treatment, it's not gonna get any better, okay? So I encourage that. Now the next and final thing I'm gonna talk about is cloth pads and how both men and women may find some relief from those. Home stretch gang. Okay, so now we're going to talk about what I do to deal with my remaining um, stress incontinence symptoms on a day to day basis. Okay, um, I have three of my personal pads that I'm going to show you, and I'm going to talk to you about why these are my favorite kinds to wear when I am choosing a pad specifically for catching tinkle oopsies, which is what I call them. Um, and for men, I, I, I want to encourage you to consider these as an option as well. Now, obviously, the ones I'm going to show you, one of them is really cute and has girly stuff on it. But, you know, as a man, if you suffer from urinary incontinence, you're probably having to wear something to protect your garments from accidental leakage, right? 
Um, and I'm going to suggest that perhaps something like this can serve your needs better. And of course you can get them in plain colors. They certainly don't have to look or feel like a feminine product to you. Um, there are quite a few people out there who are more than happy to cater to the desires of men and women as well who do not care to have something cutesy in their underwear um, because they don't think there's anything cutesy about their um, incontinence issues. However, I'm kind of a girl. So the ones I'm going to show you, a little bit girly, but this type of, of, of pad can be made and, and then you don't have to wear something that's disposable and going to irritate your skin. You certainly don't have to wear like a full coverage. Um, one of the things that I've noticed is that for men, they, the, they don't really have any incontinence pads. They keep them on the feminine hygiene aisle. And I just think that's disrespectful to men. I, I, I really do because I understand how men feel about being emasculated in that way, I sympathize, okay? I, I get it, I, I truly get it. But neither should a man who only has minor incontinence have to wear something like a full diaper, as it were, because number one, that's gonna irritate all the skin on your body. It completely um, robs you of the, your personal choice for undergarment, because if you're having to wear something like that that's a full uh, diaper, um, then you can't wear your boxers or your briefs or, or whatever your personal underwear choice would be. However, these are the things that I use, and I'm going to tell you which fabrics they're made of and why I like them the best for this application. Okay, this first one is a pad that I made, and this is the one that I was telling you is kind of girly. And this fabric, I don't know if you can really tell on the camera, but this fabric is flannel. It's cotton flannel, and in other parts of the world you call it flannelette. Um, it's the material that pajamas are very commonly made out of. They make bed sheets out of this stuff. You know, you can find it in all different kinds of patterns and stuff. Uh, solid colors. You can get them in solid black. You can get them in solid red. You can get them in solid white. You can get them in various plaids. You know, pretty much any design you think of, there's a flannel print out there. I got this one because, I'm sorry, she's adorable, right? Uh, this came off the arm of a pair of pajamas. Uh, anyway, flannel, flannelette, is just brushed cotton. It has been brushed until it has what we call a nap on it, which means that it's 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 got this soft layer of fibers that stick up. And it tends to get a little bit pilly, but this pad is about a year old now. And you can see that it's still very smooth, it's very soft. You can see a little bit of pilling, but you don't feel that. But the utility of flannel in urinary incontinence collection is that it it absorbs immediately. It's it's very, very quick absorbing. So when you sneeze and it goes, you know, you may be wearing a pad that has enough absorbent layers inside it to cope with the volume that you just released. But if this top layer is not quickly absorbent, the fluid can spread and go over the edges of the pad before it has a chance to soak in. And the reason I like flannel for just daily use, you know, when I don't expect that there's gonna be anything significant going on, but my just in case, I wear these every day. I prefer flannel for that reason, because if I sneeze or if I cough, or if I laugh really hard at something or something catches me off guard, this is going to take care of it and it's going to absorb it quickly enough that it's not gonna be a problem. Now I have very minor incontinence. And so this little pad here, you can see how thin it is. I don't even feel it when I'm wearing it, okay? So this is like a daily use kind of pad. And I can do in another video how I would construct it and what I would suggest in the absorbent layers. But for right now, I'm talking about topper fabrics only. Flannel is the number one choice for daily use for very minor incontinence. This is another one. This is cotton fleece. This is made out of cotton fleece, AKA in the United States, sweatpants, sweatshirts. This shirt that I am wearing right here is made out of cotton fleece. It is a sweatshirt, sweatshirt hoodie, sweatpants, um, sweatshirts, uh, workout clothing that's made for warmer weather. It's made out of cotton fleece. And if you wanted to just order the fabric, you would order cotton fleece. If you wanted to use to make your own, if you wanted to cut something up in your house, pair of sweatpants, sweatshirt, hoodie like this one, that's what this is made out of. Oops. And like flannel, it absorbs immediately. And I like to use the fuzzy side of the cotton fleece on the back because it doesn't rub against the underwear. Incidentally, the inside of this one is gym socks. And this is one of my favorite daily wear incontinence pads because like flannel, for whatever reason, this smooth surface on cotton fleece 
extraordinarily absorbent, just like that. It, it, it soaks it up immediately. I've never had anything go off the side on this pad. Now, when I have a cold, okay, and I know that I'm going to be coughing, sneezing, that's the beauty of having stress incontinence, is that when you get the flu, you're gonna have to deal with pee, too. Oh, that's fun, let me tell you. I'm three minutes and 45 seconds into this, so I'm gonna finish out with the final clip so this doesn't start skipping on this final pad. Okay, so, so this final pad that I'm gonna show you, this is the kind of thing that I wear when I'm having a cold. When I know I'm gonna be sneezing and coughing a lot or blowing my nose, because that's the thing, people with stress incontinence will feel me. When you have nasal congestion, every time you blow your nose, what happens? You pee a little. So. This pad right here is 13 inches long. It's a big one, but when you're actually wearing it, it doesn't feel like a big one. That's the beauty of this. This particular pad was not made by me. This was made by Heather from Annie Bell's Essentials. Um, this length is no longer available in her shop. I think she has a 12 inch length now, which would work exactly the same way. This topper material is organic bamboo velour. Um, velour is made, usually you can get bamboo, you can get cotton, bamboo cotton mixes, however you want to get it, if it's a natural fiber, a bamboo or a cotton velour. And it's, let me see if I can show you on the camera if you can see how plush it is. I'm going to try my best so that you can see the plush nature of this fabric. But because it's not a polyester, I do not recommend minky for urinary incontinence. I'll tell you why in just a second. Minky is not a good choice. Cotton or bamboo velour if you want a really fuzzy one. And when I'm sick, I use this. These are, this is an ultra heavy overnight pad, so it has a lot more absorbent layers in it. So when I have a flu or I have a cold, I wear a pad like this that has a cotton or bamboo velour top and that has lots of stuff on the inside. Because if I'm gonna be blowing my nose, if I'm gonna be coughing, if I'm gonna be sneezing because I'm sick, I'm gonna need one of these. And if you are a person with moderate incontinence, a pad like this with a topper like this is also what I would recommend for you. If you have more than just a few drips on a daily basis, you can still be served by something as discreet as this and nobody will see this through your pants. Nobody's gonna see that you're wearing this when you sit down, if you bend over to pick up a pencil, especially for the gentleman, don't be afraid of something like this. Trust me, this is far less likely to be noticeable to others than a really thick, disposable. Not to mention the fact that it's going to be so much more comfortable and you're going to be so glad you did it. The final fabric that I like, I don't have a pad to demonstrate for you right now, but the final fabric is actually probably the best one for people who have moderate to heavy incontinence and that is charcoal bamboo fleece or charcoal cotton fleece. And the reason that one's better is because any of the natural fibers that have been chemically treated with charcoal, they absorb odors and they wick. So it's a stay dry kind of fabric. Um, I don't have one right now to show you, but that one is an excellent fabric is the charcoal bamboo or the charcoal cotton fleece. Anything treated with charcoal is going to be excellent for retaining odor, especially if your urine has a strong odor. Uh, that might help you out a little bit um, and it wicks it away from the skin absorbs extraordinarily quickly and it helps you stay dry all day okay oh and then finally the reason I do not recommend minky and the reason or any 100% polyester topper is because um, it is uh, because it is a synthetic fiber itself it the, the fibers on top themselves are not absorbent so even though it feels fuzzy and it feels great and everything if you release urine onto that it's gonna go all over the place personal experience, no minky pads for incontinence, okay? Um, in addition to which, synthetic fibers, kind of like the disposable pads, they do not mask odor at all. And so if you have an accident and it's gonna be an hour or two before you can go and put on a clean pad, you're gonna be walking around and, 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 and the odor part of urinary incontinence is the part that is the most embarrassing. So um, I strongly recommend staying away from anything that is 100% polyester as a topper fabric for your incontinence pads. Okay, thanks for watching. I know this got long, but you know, there were some discussions in the Facebook group and, it, and it, it really does. It breaks my heart when I see people talking about how ashamed they are. Um, I've just, I've chosen since I started this YouTube channel, the reason I started it is because I'm tired of being ashamed of things that are beyond my control, that, that are not my fault, that I didn't do anything, and that quite frankly, in and of themselves, they're just things that people have decided are socially taboo 
they are not, they should, there should not be this level of shame. It is a very utilitarian thing. And I'm a pragmatist. I am a pragmatic girl. It's like, okay, here's my problem. What do I do to fix it? If you have incontinence, what you do to fix it is you go and you make sure that you understand fully why you have your incontinence problem, what has caused it, what treatments are available to you, and then once you have pursued uh, diagnosis and treatment, you decide how you want to handle it. And I handle mine with cloth pads because they work. They take care of me. And I have never had more comfortable skin dealing with this than since I switched to cloth. So. Again, I hope you have found this helpful. Um, thanks for watching. Thanks for supporting the channel. And I will talk to you again about something more interesting and less uncomfortable than urinary incontinence very soon. Thanks. Bye.